Artificial intelligence is here, but how exactly is AI going to unleash the next level of human potential? Joining me now with thoughts is Adam Burden. He's the Global Innovation Lead at Accenture. Thanks so much for joining me today, Adam. Thank you, Allie. It's good to be here. Great to see you. So if AI is supposed to be transformational for humans, why is it so difficult to harness that power sometimes? It's a, it's a great question. And I think one we've, we've thought about for ages, why is technology so difficult to interface with? And it's really because we've made tools that are artificial to a degree. Um, think about things like keyboards and others that cause you problems with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, you know, we've never, we've always adapted uh, people to technology rather than the other way around. And now with this new era of artificial intelligence and AI, it's actually adapting more to us. Think about it. When I ask like a question of chat GPT or I put a prompt in, uh, I can ask the same question three or four different ways and I'll still get a response, not exactly the same response, but I'll still get a response along the lines of what I was asking about. It's never been that way before. Now we're entering this era where technology is more human by design, which is actually the subject and title of our technology vision for 2024 here at Accenture. Yeah, so I think that then begs the question, the more artificial intelligence becomes human-like, how are humans going to be able to stay in control? Yeah, it, look, uh, we, we have wrestled with this as well. And, uh, you know, we think that, first of all, we're not really at an era, in, in an era or a point of development in artificial intelligence technology where it's autonomous. Um, but is that possibility on the horizon? For sure. But there's actually even more um, specific things to pay attention to right now. Like we want to make sure that AI systems um, don't have bias in terms of the way that they've learned, that the data that they've been trained on uh, is safe um, and it's been controlled and in in managed in a way and built in a way that's going to give you accurate answers. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I like to, to tell people is like, have you ever wondered why when you ask certain generative AI systems, um, you know, draw me a picture of a boat, that if you ask that same question a few minutes later, it'll draw you a picture of a boat, but it'll actually be pretty different. Have you ever wondered why that's the case? Let me demystify that because I think it's actually really fascinating. It's an, and it's a picture that reveals why you shouldn't perhaps be so concerned uh, about the control of AI. Um, there isn't a, uh, an auto autonomous agent behind there. Maybe at one point there will be with something called artificial general intelligence. But the way this actually works is you can actually turn up and down a parameter called temperature. Um, and the way that data is actually stored in these AI systems, it's this massive array of information it's very difficult to wrap your head around, but imagine a thousand dimensions of, of data. And if you just change, tweak slightly, the amount and way that you route yourself through that data to get to answers or to draw a picture of a boat, you might end up with a yacht in one picture and a rowboat uh, in another one, but they're all gonna lead you down towards drawing a picture of a boat. There are ways to change that temperature. You can actually adjust it in a prompt. Try it yourself. Go set temperature to zero, and it'll actually stop making variations uh, in it. And when, you, when you're able to do that and kind of demystify that, it kind of takes some of the concern out of it. So I think there's quite a bit to do here. One is, you know, making sure the data sets that we're training on are, are unbiased, uh, making sure that, you know, that we understand the implications of, of what we're doing with this data. But it's also about demystifying and sort of sharing with people, how is this really working under the covers? Because then it makes them much more comfortable to actually function and operate it. Exactly, because I think on the other end of the spectrum, then there could be concerns about too much human control right. and who are those humans making those decisions. And exactly. So I think that's what the business world and consumers alike are dealing with right yeah, now. That's, that, that is another excellent point about uh, you know being able to explain why have we gotten to certain uh, responses in this. Uh, I think that you'll see more and more AI systems start to put the provenance of, mm -hmm. of data um, as it's assembling answers, uh, especially in the year ahead, because uh, many companies have now begun to embrace almost like an AI code of ethics, um, where they want AI systems to be explainable. Why did you arrive at this particular answer? What was it that you were trained on that encouraged you to do this? What was the temperature setting when you arrived uh, to, to actually build this particular idea or to create that picture of the boat? Why did you do, do it in that particular way? Because we want uh, these to not be black boxes. We actually want to understand exactly why certain things were assembled in that way. 
Um, it's uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like taking it out of the black box, so to speak, uh, and putting it into a transparency so that we can understand from end to end why things are happening that way. Right. And so AI is no longer just a novelty. There are <laughs> real world applications uh, that are becoming quite transformational. And it seems like we're only just now starting to understand the, the potential. So I think there's a question of, is AI going to be this big job killer or you know what is mm. going to be the learning curve for companies to harness AI for good? Yeah, uh, uh, we've seen this movie many times, uh, Ali. I, I, I think about this a lot too, and I think about it with my own kids, right? Like what, what types of jobs are gonna be available for them? But I, I take comfort personally, and, and the way Accenture looks at this as well, is if you look back in history uh, at different technology revolutions that have taken place, they've always preceded a massive growth in new jobs and new opportunities. Let me, let me ask you a question. In the early 1940s, what was the biggest uh, employer of women in the United States? Well, I don't know right offhand, but that sounds like a great question for an LLM, I'm sure. But uh, but you are the closest thing we have to AI in this interview. No, so. no, definitely not. But <laughs> I will tell you, like that was actually as a switchboard operator. And how many switchboard operators do you know today? Right. Almost none. Right. There's there's um, virtually zero employment in that space, uh, and you know they were replaced by automated switching equipment, telephones. Yes, we are going to see transition. Um, into new employment, but there will be new things that pop up. Like, for example, prompt engineers. Prompt engineering is going to become a big profession for a lot of people, and it will change the way that they do things. So I take a lot of confidence um, that history is a great guide in this regard. We saw the same thing in the Industrial Revolution. We saw the same thing in the 1940s. And yeah, there will be some disruption here, but it's going to be good disruption. It's going to unleash people from the ordinary and let them do more extraordinary. Yeah. So what do you think is going to be in 2024 the most transformational use case that is here now available for <laughs> companies to take advantage of for their businesses? Well, I, I look, there's so much that I'm personally excited about because I work in this area every day. But if I think about for, for employers, like this past year has been a year of experimentation um, and getting their data sorted into mm -hmm. a right way. 2024 is going to be about putting AI into practice. Uh, and when I talk to boards of directors and when I talk to CEOs, what they're interested in seeing is what about augmentation of people? So much of AI has been about how um, do we automate uh, business processes or steps in business processes. Uh, now it's going to be about how do we make people and actually um, amplify their capabilities. Um, I, I was, I, I'm a software engineer by training. That's what I've done a lot of my career. And I've been working with some advanced AI systems that we do that help me write software much, much faster than I was able to in the past. It doesn't do it perfectly but it creates a great first draft. Uh, and if I can accelerate that, I can actually do more. Um, you know, it, it, another thing about this is pretty interesting is that um, uh, we always look at and, and work at, through a backlog when we're doing software engineering. Uh, we're looking at this massive backlog of things to do. What if I can work through the backlog twice as fast or three times as fast as I currently can? It doesn't mean that I'm going to run out of work to do. It just means I'm going to be able to deliver outcomes to my customers and my business partners and my employees much faster than I can today. Uh, I think this concept of human augmentation mm -hmm. is going to be the biggest thing that's going to hit people in the coming year, but it's going to make us more creative, more capable, and more productive than we've ever been in the past. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that productivity angle is huge. Excited to see what the year holds. So to cap things off, what do you think is the biggest challenge and also the biggest opportunity for businesses when they're thinking about yeah. AI? Look, uh, Ali, we, we, we spent a lot of time uh, talking with clients and helping them develop strategies around AI. We've had uh, 3,000 some conversations with client C-suites uh, in the past year to just talk to them about artificial intelligence. Uh, so I think I got a pretty good bead uh, on this one. Um, the, the, the way that I would look at in terms of the challenge side, it's all about the data. Many enterprises don't have their data organized in a way which is going to be conducive to take advantage of, of artificial intelligence in the future. Uh, they're going to have to spend some time and invest some resources to do genuine data management activities, data cleansing, um, 
uh, data deduplication and actually organizing this data. Good news is, is that our, uh, AI can actually help them do some of that a little bit faster than being able to in the, in the past, but it still is a lot of work to be done to be able to take advantage of it. So data is going to be a big barrier uh, to that. And maybe to some extent, you know, evolving regulation and getting people uh, comfortable with that, but I'd actually be more concerned about the data. The regulation will come along and be able to support businesses and what they're trying to do here. Um, on the biggest opportunity that's in front of them, um, I really, I, I look at the, the productivity uh, area that we've talked about, and I think that productivity improvements from this are going to be extraordinary. You know, when you look at things like um, uh, GDP and, and the relationship to productivity, you know, we need another exponential boost. You know, we've kind of petered out a little bit on where we were um, in terms of automation and, and robotics and uh, factory floor type of capabilities in terms of automation. We need something for the white collar workforce, but also the all collar workforce to be able to do more. And this is going to give us that boost. It's actually going to allow us to do much more uh, than we've been able to in the past. So productivity is going to be a very big uh, benefit that's going to be driving from there. And it is the biggest opportunity that all companies should be looking at and saying, how can we harness this and do it in our most strategic places? Uh, we think that we're going to see a lot of this, especially where um, we want to augment people. Um, so marketing uh, type of areas to make them faster and be able to do things in a more personalized way than they've ever done in the past. Uh, and even in, in back office processes where it would be beneficial to augment or automate uh, some of those capabilities so that you can spend more time focused on your customers and their biggest challenges. That makes sense. Thanks so much, Adam, for sharing your insights today. It was great speaking with you. Thank you, Allie. I really enjoyed the time.